In this lecture, we're going to press on and investigate Van Til's apologetic, focusing on the apologetical method, the worldview approach to apologetics, and the way evidence functions in apologetical argument, especially in the theology of Cornelius Van Til. And we're going to look at Acts 17, verses 30 through 31. And the reason we're going to look at that is we realize that Van Til's apologetic, remember, is an apologetic that relies on revelation, an apologetic that is rooted in the voluntary self-disclosure of the triune God in a history of special revelation that is covenantal in character. And after the fall, that history of special revelation finds its climactic capstone expression in the death, represented by the cross, and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, is a pivotal text on which Van Til relied in his published corpus in order to make a point about the apologetical method worldview and the use of evidence in a consistently Christian apologetic that is rooted in revelation and seeks to honor the triune God and the Christ who has been crucified, raised, and ascended. Paul's address on Mars Hill, recorded in Acts 17, 16 through 34, presents us with the locus classicus of the Pauline apologetic. Any apologist who's interested in understanding precisely how Paul reasoned with unbelieving Athenian philosophers, how he invoked evidence, how he presented the resurrection, what constellation of theological presuppositions informed his argument, cannot go anywhere other than this programmatic text. Uh, it bears on assumptions that inform the use of reason, the presentation of argument and evidence in apologetical disputation. And it's a key text on which Van Til himself depended and sought to develop. Now, this lecture will not deal with all of that passage from verse 16 to 34. We're going to restrict it for the purposes of this course to verses 30 and 31 primarily and ask the question, what is it that Paul presupposes when he presents the resurrection of Christ as proof of final judgment? Why does Christ's death and his resurrection in particular prove the certainty and inescapability of final judgment? And why does it ground a universal call to repent? given that God has appointed a day to judge the world in righteousness through the one who has been raised. And so the argument is designed to demonstrate that Paul presupposed the entire redemptive historical framework from Genesis to Revelation, the sum total of the history of special revelation was presupposed and guided his presentation of the resurrection and its implications for all men everywhere. Recent scholarship on the book of Acts has recognized this basic point, that in Paul's presentation, conversion to a new worldview was required. An entirely different worldview than what the Athenian philosophers presupposed was not only operative in Paul's argument, but central and integral in the presentation of the resurrection as a fact and the resurrection in its meaning. In fact, the point couldn't be made any clearer that there is, in the words of even D.A. Carson, a massive clash of worldviews operating in this presentation. And so please recognize this. Worldview thinking does not originate in some post-enlightenment philosophical construct. Worldview thinking is intrinsic to covenant and the history of special revelation and is nuclear to the Apostle Paul's apologetic, which we as Reformed theologians following in the tradition of Voss and Van Til must maintain. And so I'm going to develop this argument about the role of the resurrection as evidence of final judgment in terms of five propositions. And I'll give some quotations from Van Til along the way in order to help you see the congruity 
that exists between the biblical material, a careful and uh, responsible reading of Paul on the one side, and Van Til's presuppositional approach to apologetics and the use of evidence and the conception of method and worldview in Van Til's apologetic on the other side. And the first point that I want to make is that Paul, the theologian of redemptive history, is Paul the apologist for the resurrection of Christ. And the general point is this, theology that derives from the revealed categories of the prophetic and apostolic scripture is what regulates the presentation of both the fact and the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It becomes clear in the development of Paul's argument that the, Paul the theologian of redemptive history is Paul the apologist for the resurrection of Christ. And this is critical to understand for all who want to be faithful, biblical, and reformed apologists. Paul does not argue with one set of presuppositions as a theologian and another set of presuppositions as an apologist. He doesn't evacuate his theology in order to reason apologetically, even with unbelieving Stoic and Epicurean philosophers on Mars Hill. Paul is not methodologically schizophrenic. Paul does not alter his fundamental theological approach to covenant history when he speaks of the resurrection of Christ, particularly in Acts 17, 30, and 31. He presents instead a compressed, terse overview of covenant history and situates the resurrection of Christ within its revealed categories, a history of special revelation. Regarding Paul's preaching in general, Herman Ritterboss in Paul, an outline of his theology, notes this, that the whole of Paul's preaching can be summarized as the proclamation and explication of the eschatological time of salvation inaugurated with Christ's advent, death, and resurrection. He goes on to say that it is from this principal point of view and under this denominator that the separate themes of Paul's preaching can be understood and penetrated in their unity and relation to one another. And what holds true in Acts 17.31 is this, that Paul the theologian of the history of salvation is Paul the apologist for the resurrection of Christ and its implications for all people everywhere. So apologetics is not ever a pre-theological autonomous philosophical discipline. You must get that out of your minds once and for all if you want to follow a biblical, reformed, Vantillian apologetical method that takes seriously the worldview implication of the scripture and the evidential function of Christ's resurrection in redemptive history. Now, in order to prove this point that Paul is not methodologically schizophrenic, I want us to talk secondly about the nature of the resurrection in his presentation. And the first point that needs to be appreciated is that on the one hand, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is presented as an eschatological event that brings into view final judgment. As an eschatological event, Christ's resurrection is an epoch-changing occurrence that guarantees the certainty of a universal, future, and final act of God's righteous judgment against sin. It's not presented as something to be placed in Ripley's Believe It or Not. It's not a neutral fact that simply exists out there lacking meaning and significance. The eschatological character of the resurrection emerges very clearly throughout the address, but it's accentuated especially in verse 30 where Paul says that, therefore, although God overlooked the times of ignorance, he now, 
Tanun commands all men everywhere to repent. Now the specific call to repent is grounded in a decisive intervention by God in redemptive history that is tethered inseparably to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. An intervention which, contrary to the past, now heightens the universal responsibility of all hearers everywhere. Paul argues that the exaltation of Jesus Christ inaugurates a change in redemptive historical era so that after the resurrection of Christ, covenant history has in principle reached its climax. The righteous one has been vindicated and appointed as judge of all. And so in verse 30, Paul says, Although God overlooks such times of ignorance, he now commands all men everywhere to repent. The radical change that coincides with the new era established by the resurrection of Christ cannot be overstated. Herman Ritterboss and Paul says, In the resurrection, the time of salvation promised in Christ, the new creation, dawns in an overwhelming manner as a decisive transition from the old world to the new world. End of quote. The former epochs of overlooking sin have given way to a new eon in which God requires repentance of all men everywhere in light of Christ's resurrection from the dead. And so the times of ignorance stand in sharp contrast to now, the time inaugurated by the advent of Christ in his death and resurrection. Notice that Paul does not state in, verses, in verse 30a that only the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers that he addresses must repent and were ignorant although 23 and 29 prove they were, in fact, ignorant in a significant sense. But rather, he predicates ignorance of an entire historical epoch prior to Christ and says now that given the resurrection of Christ, those former epochs have given way to a new age, a new era, a new era that is decisively inaugurated by Jesus Christ. And so the center and fulcrum on which history turns is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not a bare, isolated occurrence. It is the event on which the ages pivot and turn. And the resurrection, as such, is not only then an eschatological event, but it's an event that guarantees future judgment, and as such, it is a covenantal event. It is a covenantal event. Um, consider this. When Christ rises from the dead, there is a solidaric dimension to his resurrection that implicates believers and unbelievers alike. The one resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead has implications for every single person who has lived, is living, or will live. It is a concrete event in redemptive history with universal application for all men everywhere. And that comes into view when Paul says that all men everywhere are required to repent. Why? Well, the resurrection of Christ from the dead simultaneously guarantees the salvation of the first fruits, of which Christ is first, the first fruits of one great resurrection harvest, the church. But at the same time, it secures condemnation for those who are not his church, for covenant breakers. The resurrection of Christ is a concrete event in redemptive history with universal significance for all men everywhere. And it's that 
universal significance that implies the resurrection is a covenantal event. Reformed theology traditionally has explained solidarity with Adam in covenantal terms, parallel to the explanation of the church's solidarity with the second Adam in covenantal terms. In Romans 5, 12 through 20, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 58, from Paul's redemptive historical perspective, it is Christ's resurrection as the second Adam that ensures his resurrection vindicates him as the judge of all. And history is therefore divided in terms of those who are united to the first Adam in his sin, guilt, and misery, and those who are united to the last Adam in his righteousness as raised and living forever. As second Adam, Christ stands in a solidaric relationship to all men as either redeemer or judge. And this is especially clear when we recognize the dimension of what Paul is saying. Richard Gaffin makes this point when describing Jesus' messianic baptism of death on the cross, both in terms of promise and fulfillment. In Perspectives on Pentecost, page 15, he says this, that from the perspective of promise, symbolized by, by um, John's water baptism, Christ's death, Christ's messianic death, is a baptism of death on the cross that involves, quote, eschatological judgment, which is of a piece with the great discriminating activity of cleansing the world threshing floor. Or to vary the metaphor slightly, harvesting the world field at the end of history. In terms of fulfillment, Pentecost, quote, is component with the fiery baptism of final judgment set by the New Testament to be executed at his return. In other words, whether viewed from the standpoint of promise or fulfillment, Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection and ascension involves the same judgment ordeal that awaits the world at the end of this age. Therefore, Gaffin's formulation helps us grasp how the baptism ordeal of Christ that he endured on the cross is the same ordeal that awaits the world at the end of this age. And you either pass through that judgment in union with Christ as Redeemer, or you bear that judgment by Christ as judge at the end of this age. So Paul's resurrection theology perfect, perfectly complements Luke's theology of Pentecost. And in fact, Acts 17 brings that theology of Pentecost into sharp focus and clear application to unbelieving philosophers. Now, the necessity of a righteous judgment seems unavoidable when we consider this fact, that in Acts 17, especially from verses 24 through 31, Paul is uh, prosecuting a covenant lawsuit against Athenian idolaters. Following the general pattern of a covenant lawsuit, Paul identifies the idolaters as creaturely vassals of the great king. Hathaos, God, and Lord, identifying the king by name in verse 24. Verses 24 through 26 provide the reasons why the Athenians ought to worship and serve the living God rather than idols. The living God not only creates, but sustains all that he has created. Verse 28 identifies the culpable ignorance of idol worshipers since the living God is clearly present among them. Romans 1, 19 through 20. Then in verse 29, Paul brings the formal indictment of the lawsuit. That first phase of the process is a call to repent in verse 30b. Repent all men everywhere because God has appointed a day to judge the world in righteousness by the man who has been raised from the dead. The second phase of that process will occur on the appointed day of judgment at the end of this age, so that the two phases of this lawsuit correspond to the two epoch 
changing events of the new covenant. The first coming of Christ in his death and resurrection and the second coming of Christ visibly on the clouds to judge the world in righteousness on the last day. The first and second coming of Christ. So Paul announces an eschatological covenant lawsuit adjusted to the already and not yet categories of Jesus' resurrection and second coming. Christ's second coming marks the second and final stage of judgment from which there is no escape. In this sense, Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles charges these Athenian philosophers with idolatry and announces an impending covenant lawsuit inaugurated by Christ's first coming. Failure to repent, verse 30, constitutes a rebellious attitude toward the lawgiver and judge, thereby ensuring final judgment, verse 31. Now, I want you to think about what Paul has done just up to this point. By presenting the death and especially the resurrection of Christ in verses 30 and 31 as an eschatological event that inaugurates a new age, as a covenantal event that guarantees the future and final judgment of all people everywhere, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a history-defining event. It constitutes and defines the character of this present age in its entirety. Everything then between the first and the second coming of Christ is the outworking of an eschatological covenant lawsuit announced by the apostolic gospel of Paul. A lawsuit that is being prosecuted by the ascended Christ through his gospel and by the power of his spirit. And so, the question that we need to focus on is how Paul then moves on to present the significance of the resurrection of Christ to Athenian philosophers of a Stoic and Epicurean stripe. What, when Paul appears, appeals to the resurrection of Christ as judgment, what is he doing and what is he presupposing about the resurrection? Well, we can see so far that the resurrection of Christ is not presented apart from its meaning in the history of redemption. And so the third point, third premise that we want to affirm is this, that Paul refuses to separate the denotation or fact of the resurrection from the connotation or the meaning of the resurrection because the fact and the meaning of the resurrection are covenantally and eschatologically qualified. The fact and the meaning of the resurrection, listen, are equally enveloped in the history of redemption and derive both meaning and significance from them. So consider this for a moment. Paul does not present the fact of the resurrection apart from the meaning of the resurrection. The Christ whom Paul proclaims is the Christ of covenant history and his resurrection is not presented apart from the revelation of God in the mystery of the apostolic gospel. Let me put it this way. The deed revelation, the deed revelation of Christ's resurrection, the fact that on the third day Jesus Christ was raised bodily from the dead, never to die again, that deed revelation is not for a moment separated from its interpretation by word revelation, the word revelation of the apostolic gospel. It is the interpretation of the gospel word that gives us the meaning of the gospel deed of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, any apologetical method 
that seeks artificially to separate the fact from the meaning of the resurrection is from a biblical standpoint defective. Now this implies something that is critical to Van Til's apologetic. Paul was not interested in offering the resurrection as an isolated factual occurrence to be neutrally reasoned about. Van Til, in Paul at Athens, page 14, notes this. It takes the fact of the resurrection to see its proper framework, and it takes the framework to see the fact. The fact is the deed revelation, the gospel provides the word revelation, and the gospel is a, is a presentation of the history of special revelation that provides the context for the meaning of the event of Christ being raised from the dead. It takes the fact of the resurrection to see the proper framework, and it takes the framework to see the fact of the resurrection. Now, Paul does just this in the Areopagus Address. He understands the resurrection of Christ in terms of its redemptive historical framework. And this is key. At no point does Paul entertain the resurrection as a brute fact. That is, as a fact that exists independent of the being, the knowledge, the decree, and the history of the covenant supplied by the triune God. To argue for the fact of the resurrection as Paul preached it is to presuppose its meaning. And to argue for the meaning of the resurrection as Paul presented it is to presuppose its factuality, its historicity. But the point of the argument is that Paul presupposes both the fact and the meaning as covenantal and eschatological. Listen to another quote from Van Til, Paul at Athens, page 11. He says, the setting is all important since it is that which gives meaning to the fact of the resurrection. The revelational setting is inherently covenantal, trinitarian, and eschatological, and it is this that invests the evidence of the resurrection with its covenant historical function. Notice that Van Til is working off of a thoroughly Pauline understanding of how the fact and the meaning of the resurrection are related. Now let me make a fourth point, um, a somewhat more philosophical point. Paul's notion of proof cannot be reduced to an ordinary standard philosophical conception of proof based on rational reflection, empirical observation, or pragmatic utility, since the conception of proof itself rests on revealed categories derived from redemptive history. In other words, it's a revelational conception of proof. And so the, the first, the final, uh, the fourth point here is it's a revelational notion of proof, or it, it proves final judgment. This means that Paul presents the resurrection in terms of its function and bearing in redemptive history and the evidential function of the resurrection is not for a moment artificially isolated from its relationship to covenant history. The empirical and rational facets of the resurrection subserve a covenantal function, operate in a covenantal framework. Listen to what Van Til says in Who Do You Say I Am, page 8. He says he, Paul, was not interested in having them endorse the resurrection as an isolated event. He was rather concerned that they accept it as the climax of the work of redemption from sin by Jesus, truly God and truly man. 
In short, men should not existentially accept the resurrection unless, in doing so, they received it as a part of the entire biblical redemptive framework. So what is Van Til saying here? He's saying this, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not an event to be accepted rationally in isolation. It is an event to be accepted by faith and in repentance from sin. Because Christ's death is a death for sin. Christ's resurrection is his vindication as the Messiah. So Van Til says that Paul called those on Mars Hill to accept a peculiar thought framework that required, quote, a new, radically different view of history from its beginning to its end, end of quote. Both of those are in Who Do You Say I Am, page 8. So Paul presented the Athenians, the resurrection of Christ, presented in a covenant lawsuit, and urged them to repent of their sin and their intellectual futility and their autonomy and their rebellion against God. Paul's notion of proof, in other words, presents the gospel of Jesus Christ to those in dire need of it. He appeals to what God has validated in Christ's resurrection, and God himself has given proof of final judgment by raising Christ from the dead. Listen to this. Van Til, in the great debate today, page 169, says this. Paul proclaimed the fact of creation, the fact of the resurrection of Christ, and the fact of the coming judgment of all men by Christ as judge, as together constituting a philosophy of history which at every point challenged the philosophy of history of the natural man in general and of the Greeks in particular. Elaborating on this, Paul says, uh, Van Til says, quoting and elaborating Paul, in his resurrection from the dead through the power of the Creator, there stood before men the clearest evidence that could be given that they who would still continue to serve and worship the creature would at the last be condemned by the Creator, then become their judge. In Van Til's assessment, the resurrection of Christ is the clearest conceivable evidence of universal and final judgment against sin because Van Til accepted and presented the resurrection in the entire biblical redemptive framework of Scripture in which it's presented in general and by Paul in particular in Acts 17. Paul does not present the resurrection as a neutral event. In fact, uh, or as an event that is open to neutral speculation and proves a number of possible conclusions. What makes it so relevant to apologetics is very simple. Paul's understanding of the meaning of the resurrection of Christ is by no means the only theory or framework by which you could understand the resurrection of Christ. For instance, the Epicurean philosophers that were present on Mars Hill in Acts 17, 18 would have a readily handy explanation for the fact that someone rose from the dead. According to the Epicureans, remember, what causes things to change in history is that the atoms that fall through space swerve and account for change and time. Temporal change is explained by a swerve in the falling of atoms. What would account for an event as unusual as the resurrection on Epicurean principles? In other words, if Paul were simply wanting to prove the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, and not challenge the presuppositions by which you interpret that evidence, what would the Epicureans do? They would say, we want to grant that Jesus rose from the dead. But what that resurrection from the dead proves is that there was a swerve 
in the falling of the atoms at the time point Jesus was raised, and lo and behold, Jesus was raised from the dead. You could just think in the Epicurean Gazette, a huge swerve in the falling of atoms occurred today when a man was raised from the dead. You see, Paul was not interested in simply trying to prove the fact of the resurrection. Paul was equally interested in proving the meaning of the resurrection. And the resurrection does not prove the Epicurean swerve. It rather proves that those who presuppose the Epicurean swerve are under judgment. And their judgment has been ensured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and his resurrection is proof of their judgment. The resurrection of Christ, understood in terms of Paul's gospel, is not a brute fact that belongs in Ripley's Believe It or Not. It vindicates Christ as the righteous judge of the world. And so the apologetical implication is obvious. Paul refuses to present the resurrection of Christ apart from redemptive historical context. And it is this point that Van Til emphasizes always in his apologetic. Let me say this. When we are presenting the evidence for the resurrection of which there is an enormous amount, what we're doing at every point is not only talking about facts, but the philosophy of the facts. We're not only talking about an occurrence in history, we're talking about the presuppositional revealed context that gives that occurrence its meaning and its significance. You see, the method that Paul is using brings into view a fundamental clash of worldview between the apostolic gospel on the one side and Epicurean and Stoic philosophy and all other forms of unbelieving thought on the other side. And so Paul's argument here, uh, and I'll put this just as a fifth point, Paul's argument reminds us that our presuppositional approach to apologetics is preeminently a biblical approach to apologetics. As we've seen from the previous propositions, Paul the apologist for the resurrection is Paul the theologian of covenant history. Paul presents the resurrection of Christ as an eschatological and covenantal event and engages in a covenant lawsuit against the Athenians. He will not separate the fact from the meaning of the resurrection, and he takes a revelational notion of proof and will not separate at any point fact and meaning in the presentation of the gospel. This means that we need to be willing to do apologetics unabashedly in light of the theology present in the pages of Scripture. And Van Til's apologetic helps us recognize that the lifeblood of Reformed apologetics is the biblical theology in the inscripturated text. We are not free to choose apologetical methods as people choose clothing. We're not free to make apologetical method a matter of taste or predisposition or personal preference. We must remember that the resurrection of Christ from the dead is not a bare, isolated occurrence that we are free to interpret any way that we wish. There is an inseparable call to repent bound up with the deed revelation of the resurrection of Christ. It's in this light, then, that I want you to think about Van Til's apologetic. We, we've said earlier in previous lessons that when we're talking about apologetics, there's a distinct philosophy of history that flows from the voluntary condescension of the triune God. And what is the nature of that history? It is, in a word, covenantal in character. And we saw how in the fall, in Genesis 3, the relationship of full-orbed fellowship with God before the fall gives way 
to fundamental ethical hostility and enmity against God after the fall. And there are two and only two types of people. And I want to say this, it's a point we can get into when we study this more deeply. But Van Til notes, based in part on what the Apostle Paul does in Acts 17, that Greek philosophers, whether it's Stoics and Epicureans or whether it's Aristotle and Plato, they are not innocent children neutrally thinking about the nature of what is ultimately real, knowable, and good. They have just as much an axe to grind against God as Adam had in the Garden of Eden after he fell into sin and became an enemy of God, losing his original righteousness, becoming guilty before God, and his whole nature being entirely corrupted by sin in his mind, in his affections, and in his will. And so what Paul is doing here is, a, in, from one standpoint, it's an application of a principle that we could look at if we had more time in Philippians, uh, pardon me, in uh, Colossians 2, 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through empty and hollow philosophy, which depends on what? depends on the elemental principles of this world and on human tradition rather than on Christ, this Christ, the self-attesting Christ of Scripture. There is an underlying comprehensive ethical antithesis between the believer and the unbeliever, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the supreme point where that antithesis receives its sharpest expression. And Paul's apologetic was bound on taking that resurrection fact, presenting it in terms of a covenant lawsuit, and calling all men everywhere to repent. So the method, the worldview, and the presentation of evidence operate in terms of what Van Til called a revelational epistemology, an approach that begins and ends in revelation. So Paul's argument on Mars Hill provides us with a template for a true presuppositional presentation of the resurrection that unearths the conflict of worldviews that is always present in the interpretation of any fact or any law at any point in the apologetical argument. And this is then a, a synopsis and summary from a specific biblical text with some quotations from Van Til that help you see the presuppositional character of the conflict between belief and unbelief. And this provides something of an exegetical case for the presuppositional apologetic of Cornelius Van Til, which in our module on method and worldview and evidence we'll explore in much greater detail.